We're Ariel. And Michelle. And we're, and we're the, the Board, board game, game Tutors. Tutors. Today we're going to be doing advanced concepts from the board game expansion, The Wizard's Tower, which is from the base game uh, Castle Panic. Let's go ahead and get started. All right. So today in this video, we're going to be going over all the different monster tokens and uh, also the imp tokens as well. We kind of group them together that come in the wizard's tower. So first we're going to start off with just the flying creatures and all the rules regarding that. Okay. So with flying creatures, they're obviously a bit unique because they're in the air and you can see from their tokens that they have the sky behind them. So that helps you remember that they're flying. They also have wings. So with flying creatures, there are several things that don't affect them that normally do affect monsters. So they're not affected by knights or swordsmen or tar or the card drive him back. And they're also not affected by boulders. But there are several things that do affect them, of course. Otherwise, they would just run around wreaking havoc. Obviously, all the things that don't affect them, they're thematically uh, tied to the fact that they're flying creatures. So you can't hit a flying creature with a boulder. You can't attack a flying creature with a knight. I could imagine a knight with a bow and arrow, but in this case, they don't know how to use bows and arrows. Right. So that and um, tar, you can't pour tar on a flying creature because the creature has to be below you. So mm -hmm. obviously that's one way to remember which cards, do which things don't affect flying creatures. Right. And then, so th some of the things that do, that again, they're all going to make thematic sense. So they can be hit by archers. And the special thing about this is that they can be hit by an archer that's the correct color, even if they're not in the archer ring. So, for example? So they start in the forest, and of course, um, in general, monsters can't be attacked while they're still in the forest. And then let's say here you can see the phoenix is in the knight ring. So the knight can't attack him, but if on this turn you happen to have a blue archer, you can still play that blue archer because as you can see, the phoenix is in the blue region. And so the blue archer can still um, shoot him even though he's not in the archer ring. And that applies to the swordsman ring as well. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if it was green, it would have to be green archer. If it was red, it have to be red archer. And as usual, archers, for some reason, even though the archers are in the castle, cannot shoot anybody in the castle. Right. <laughs> so uh, that is one limitation that the archers have. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's helpful to remember that rule for a while. We didn't realize that you could use an archer even if they weren't in the archer space. Yeah, we thought you could only use blue archers if they were in the blue archer range. Yeah, and so that obviously makes it a bit harder, but we have one like that. So if you want to make more of a challenge, you could make that rule yourself. But that is not an official rule. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, and then heroes also are considered to have archery, I guess, mm -hmm. because in general heroes can attack in the archer or the knight or the swordsman ring. So yeah. they are able to attack flying creatures. Yeah. So heroes have the same rules. They can't attack in the castle, but they can attack all those in all three of those ranges. Mm -hmm. So yeah, archers uh, for flying creatures only. Um, they will attack in all the blue or all the green or all the red. Right. And then, of course, the ever helpful barbarian can also attack these guys. Apparently, he also knows how to shoot. Mm -hmm. But obviously, he is the one, one of the few cards that actually works in the castle. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, none of the archers or heroes, none of them work in the forest. So obviously, keep that in mind. Yeah, so even the barbarian doesn't work in the forest, but he does work in the castle. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those are all the people that can hurt flying creatures. Mm -hmm. And then trebuchets, we're going to go over those in a little bit. They're an effect. And um, we're going to talk about that more. But trebuchets can hit flying creatures. Mm -hmm. And then um, they're just there are some wizard cards that, that hit them. Basically, the wizard cards aren't restricted when it comes to flying creatures. So obviously, uh, uh, regular fighters, they're limited in terms of how they can attack flying creatures. But wizard cards, a lot of them are combat oriented. And those wizard cards will do damage to flying creatures as long as you meet the other spec uh, specifications of said wizard card, mm -hmm. which we will explain in a future video. Mm -hmm. And then structures do affect flying creatures. So they don't like fly over walls or anything of that sort. It might seem thematic, but it would probably it probably would make them too strong. Mm -hmm. So basically a phoenix hits a wall and is injured and in fact dies because he only has one hit point and damages the wall. So... Yeah, they still affect walls. Mm -hmm. Same with towers. Same with towers, same with wizard tower. And if there's a fortification on that wall, same thing too. Uh, 
if a flying creature hits a wall with a fortification, it would damage the fortification, not the wall. And in this case, the phoenix would be dead. Mm -hmm. And also, um, so that is that. Those are all the basic rules regarding flying creatures. Right. So let's go ahead and talk about the specific flying creatures that we have. These two characters. And also, uh, there are two copies of the phoenix and two copies of the gargoyle in a game. Yeah, so you're not going to come across these a ton, but you will come across them a little bit. Mm-hmm. So, this, them here. so the special thing about the phoenix, well, as you can see, he has just one hit point, so that makes him easier to kill, obviously. But um, as we know about phoenixes, they can turn into flames, I guess. They can implode, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so when they die, when they're shot, or however you kill them, um, they basically burst into flames, and whatever monsters are beside them are going to catch fire. So yeah, it doesn't matter if it's a mega boss monster or a regular monster or just a regular old boss monster. If this phoenix is sharing a space with any other creature when it dies, um, you would put flame tokens on it. So let's just say this gargoyle was with the phoenix at the same time. When you killed the phoenix, it would go off the board, and you would put one flame token on each monster in the same space. Yeah, and so here you can see, when we say space, we mean it's the same color and the same ring, so like in the archer ring, and also the same arc, which is like that piece of the pie. So basically all those specific things narrow it down to one exact space. Mm -hmm. And as we explained in our previous video, any monster that gets set on fire, after they move, then they get dealt damage from that fire. They mm -hmm. don't get damage immediately from that fire if it, was if it was just placed on them, but after they move. Right. So that is that. Okay, so that's how phoenixes work. Okay. And then gargoyles, they basically are just flying creatures with two hit points. They don't really have any other special abilities. Aside from all those... A list of what can't hurt them and what can hurt them that we just described about flying creatures. Mm -hmm. Right? That's, so that's the, gargoyle. the gargoyles. All right. Next, we're going to talk about imps. Mm -hmm. So as you can see over here, uh, there will be more imps on the board, uh, uh, just uh, more than just these six over here. Uh, this is just for illustrative purposes. There are 18 imp tokens that can potentially be put onto the board. So um, let's just move them over here so we can look at them, and Michelle will explain what imps are. Okay, so imps stay in a separate pile, and our reasoning for that is that probably no one else likes them. They're pretty obnoxious. They look really weird. Yeah, and their purpose is basically to annoy you because they have one hit point, so they're not too difficult to kill. But they tend to come out in groups and just kind of distract you because they can cause damage, um, hmm. you know, in certain ways. And so you do have to be concerned about them. But at the same time, they're not like a major threat, each of them on their own. Usually, like Michelle said, they come out in groups. Um, not all the time, but usually they do. And so if uh, six imps are coming at you all at once, uh, all of your walls are now in danger because you might not have all the cards you need to deal with every single imp. So now uh, if six imps are approaching you from all around the board, you could just lose all of your walls if you're not being careful. Right. So imps are summoned by other things. So... Uh, We'll talk about two of those things in just a, a few minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, basically, imps, uh, they're summoned by monster one monster effect token, by one monster, and by one mega boss monster. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like we said, they're in a separate pile off to the side. That means you won't be drawing them from the bag because they, they don't function like normal monsters in that sense. Mm -hmm. So you have to have another token that, uh, that brings them onto the board. Mm -hmm. And lastly, um, when you destroy an imp, what happens, Michelle? They basically just go back to where they came from. They go back to that separate pile. So yeah. they never truly disappear. They can always get brought back from there, depending on what happens. So if you kill this imp, you put it back into his pile. Yeah, they don't go away with the other monsters. Mm -hmm. All right. So now let's go over the ways that the imps can come onto the board. Here's the first one. So this effect token. It's one of the monster tokens that's simply an effect. You can tell it's an effect by the brown border. Mm -hmm. It's called one imp per tower. So this one's pretty straightforward. You're going to look at the board and see how many towers you currently have in play. And for each of those towers, you're going to put an imp in the corresponding um, section of the forest. So that arc. Yeah. So like in this example here, if that was that the only tower that we have, then you just put an imp there in the number four arc. 
So obviously you would draw this out of the bag during step six, draw two new monsters. So if this was one that you drew, uh, any tower, including a wizard tower, uh, would yield one imp in that same arc. Mm -hmm. So if you still have all six of your towers up at that point, you're going to get one imp in every part of the forest at number four, at number five, etc. Mm -hmm. So that one's that. It's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. Here is the other way you can get imps onto the board. This is the conjurer. So he's, he's considered to be a boss monster, but not a mega boss. Mm -hmm. So the conjurer has two hit points, and he functions like a regular monster once you place him on the board. But he also brings imps onto the board with him, like we said. So you're going to roll a die when the conjurer comes out, and the number on the die tells you how many imps you're going to add to the board. And you'll start at number one. So first off, actually, so. you'd obviously roll once. So six, so you'd place the conjurer in arc six yes you'd roll the die again five so um <laughs> that's, unfortunate. Uh, that's unfortunate but basically you would put one imp in one one imp in two one imp in three one imp in four one imp in five so um and uh, that's disregarding imps that are currently on the board obviously he mm -hmm. brings his own horde of imps with him right. so <laughs> basically uh, everywhere except the one where he's at in this example uh basically he would uh put one in each forest uh, arc, yeah. which would not be cool. Yeah, so he conjured them, essentially. Yeah, so that is a monster that can bring imps onto the field. Mm -hmm. So that is that. There's also a mega boss monster called the Hydra mm -hmm. that can bring imps onto the field, and we're going to go over that when we go over mega bosses in the future. Right, so that's the only other way you can get imps onto the field. But basically, um, imps are just an annoyance that can do you a lot of damage if you're not careful enough. Obviously, if you're being swarmed by other monsters, it's kind of hard to focus on imps because you think they're not that important, but they can deal you a fair amount of damage. Right. So you need to keep them in mind when you do different things. All right. Let's go over the last two monster effect tokens that come into the game. There's only one copy of each of these, uh, just like there's only one copy of the conjurer and one copy of one imp per tower as well. Mm -hmm. So let's go over these two. Okay, so first we have the trebuchet on the left. It's basically what the name implies and what's depicted on there. It sends a boulder into the air. So that's why trebuchets affect flying creatures because the boulder is flying through the air in this case. Mm -hmm. So it goes over the heads of any creatures on the ground, but flying creatures are killed by it. And then it destroys whatever structure it comes across first. And one important thing is, like we said, it's flying. So it only hurts flying creatures. Mm -hmm. And there's only going to be potentially four on the board at one at any given time because there's only two phoenixes and two gargoyles. Mm -hmm. But it touches, uh, it does not touch any other monster. So it only hurts structures and it only hurts flying monsters. Right. So this is a similar concept to the boulders that came in the original game. Mm -hmm. So when you draw this effect token from the bag, from the monster bag then you would roll a die to see where the trebuchet goes. So like there, if you rolled a five, then the, you, you, don't, uh, you don't necessarily have to put it on the board, but you basically would visualize that it goes through there. So in this case, um, there's nothing on the board, so the trebuchet would just go straight and nothing would happen. Except if there were flying monsters in arc five or in arc two, all of those flying monsters would be dead now. Exactly. So it would kill any flying monsters that, it, that were in its path that it came across up until it hit the first available structure. However, if it was four, put it in the four, you'd see this. What's the first thing it hits? It's the wall. The wall's gone. Mm -hmm. And then the trebuchet is gone. Mm -hmm. So the trebuchet is pretty straightforward. It's just a boulder, except it only hurts flying creatures mm -hmm. and structures. Yep. Okay, next one. Then we have the flaming boulder. So again, this is very similar to the boulder from before. The flaming boulder is not going through the sky, but it is on fire. So like we already talked about, you would roll a die to see which arc it goes through. Mm -hmm. Let's just pretend it's a four. Mm -hmm. So then you would sort of visualize the flaming boulder going through. It would kill any monsters that were on the ground, so any non-flying monsters. Okay. And then it would hit that wall because that's the first available structure. It would destroy that wall. And then the special thing it would do is it would set the next structure on fire. So we put a flame token there on the tower. If it will cooperate with me, it doesn't like me. There we go. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, And you only put one flame token. 
Right. So basically, the flaming boulder destroys the first structure it hits, and then the next one behind it gets a flame token. Mm -hmm. And obviously, uh, if the flaming boulder went through an empty area, nothing would happen except monsters would die. Um, and also here, um, yeah, so basically, uh, it just depends. Like, you just use your logic. First one destroyed, second one gets one fire. Mm -hmm. All right, let me go ahead and grab that and put this wall back up. So those are the new effects that we wanted to talk about. All right, let's continue with the rest of the monster tokens, because um, even though, obviously, effects don't seem like monster tokens, they're the same shape as monster tokens, and you can draw them out of the monster bag. Yep. So they are technically monster tokens. Right. So here's the next guy. He's a loner. He, there's only one copy of him in the game. So this is the doppelganger. He's maybe the most unique new monster. Mm -hmm. As you can see, he doesn't have any hit points of his own. He just has an X there. So what you're going to do when you draw the doppelganger is roll a die and see where in the forest ring to place him. So if we got a five, we'd put him here in the forest right. ring. Mm -hmm. And then he doesn't move on his own. He basically sits there and waits. And the next monster that you kill, it doesn't go off the board. It actually goes to this spot where the doppelganger is. So as soon as you kill another monster, like let's say you killed the gargoyle next, mm -hmm. you would remove the doppelganger token and put the gargoyle there where it used, where the doppelganger used to be. At full health. Yeah. So the gargoyle would be at full health and would then progress like normal as if you had just drawn him from the bag. Mm -hmm. And also, if you use a doppelganger and... Um... Uh, so obviously, you don't want to pick powerful monsters uh, because the first monster that you kill after the doppelganger comes out, that is the one that will replace the doppelganger. Right. With the exception of mega boss monsters are ineligible. Uh, they, they don't. They aren't getting reincarnated by the doppelganger. <laughs> yeah. So if you killed a mega boss monster next, you would get rid of it like normal, and then the next monster that you killed would take the place of the doppelganger. So. Boss monsters, just regular boss monsters, uh, regular monsters, uh, even pretty powerful regular monsters. They would all come back to where the doppelganger is, and yeah, so take it wouldn't its place. move, and yeah, take its place. Mm -hmm. So obviously that is important, and also in the very unlikely event that you kill two monsters simultaneously, so not one monster and then another monster, but let's just say two monsters died at the very same mo moment because let's just say they killed each other, for example, which you'll find out is a possibility in the game. If they both kill each other, uh, players get to choose which monster is put in the place of the doppelganger, mm -hmm. but that's the only time. So when you're deciding like the order to play your cards after the doppelganger comes out, you want to think about which monster you kill first and try to have it be one that's not going to be too devastating to have come back on the board. A relatively weak one, obviously. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a doppelganger. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go ahead and do this pile of three. Okay, so this is the ogre. There are three copies of him in the expansion. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't like the trolls in the original game, you really won't like the ogre because he has four hit points. So the trolls had three, but he has four. So he's that much harder to kill. He still has a triangle shaped token, but you can see they put the four in that special spot in the middle there. So, so if you're going to put him on the board, the four would be the one facing towards the castle mm -hmm. at first, and then the three, and then the two. Etc. Mm -hmm. So nothing special about him. He's just big and burly. Yeah, he's just tough to kill because he does take four hit points. So obviously you want to start attacking him as soon as you can when he starts out in the forest. Or, or if, you know, comes from the forest. Or if possible, start burning him immediately so that way he'll start every step he takes, he'll lose one hit point. Right, right. So okay. that can happen with flames. Then we have the goblin cavalry. Mm -hmm. And do we know how many of these are in the game? There are two. Yeah, so just two of these new ones. So the Goblin Cavalry, as you can see, have two hit points. And what's really special about them is that they move two spaces, mm -hmm. I guess, because it's cavalry. They move mm -hmm. faster. So instead, uh, once he starts in the forest, he would not go to the archer range. He would go immediately to the knight range. Right. When he moves, uh, technically, when everyone else moves one space, he moves two. 
Right. So even if you draw an effect card that says, like, let's say he's in the blue, it says blue monsters move, that's in the original game, and you'll still have it, um, then you basically would still move him two spaces, because when he moves, he moves two spaces. Except once he reaches the castle, then he starts moving one space like normal. And clockwise, obviously. Mm -hmm. So after he's past the wall, and once he's in the castle, so um, then he would just go one each time clockwise right. and if you happen to catch him on fire when he moves two spaces he still only gets one damage because that's considered a single movement so if he's on fire um uh let's say for example uh you use something to set him on fire then when he moves two spaces then after moving two spaces he would lose one health only even though he moved two spaces because that was technically one movement for him mm -hmm. so that's the goblin cavalry mm -hmm. right uh, next monster right here the right. climbing troll so here's the climbing troll he has three hit points like a regular troll but what's special about him is that he climbs over walls so mm -hmm. that means he doesn't damage them and they don't damage him so in this example as the climbing troll comes towards the wall normally uh, a wall will hold a monster back for one whole turn the monster will hit the wall uh, the wall will go away. The monster is still in the swordsman ring mm -hmm. for one more turn. But in this example, because he is a climbing troll, he simply walks over this wall. Oops. <laughs> he walks <laughs> over the wall. So he goes here. So when he's in the swordsman ring, he moves forward, goes over the wall, immediately smacks into the tower, knocks it over. Not like that, but yeah, there. there. Mm -hmm. And now he is in that space that that tower occupied. And since he hit the tower... He goes down by one. Right. So he can get into the castle faster than you expect if you're not thinking carefully about it. Mm -hmm. So you obviously you want to keep your eyes out for this guy. There's two copies of him in the game. So um, obviously another person you want to kill as, me as fast as you possibly can and set on fire in the hopes that he'll die on his own uh, while moving forward towards the castle. Mm -hmm. And speaking of fire, the one way he can be affected by a wall is if it's on fire when he passes over it. Right. He won't immediately get hurt, but he will receive flame tokens equal to the number of flame tokens that's on the wall, that are on the wall. So he basically copies it. So if there's one flame token on the wall, he passes over and gains one flame token. So obviously he'd destroy a tower if it was behind that thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to move the wall out of the way just for illustrative purposes. But so the wall's over. It's there. But anyway, he copies the flame because he burned himself, the weirdo. And <laughs> um, yeah, so now he has a flame token. But since he acquired this flame token while moving over the wall, he is not damaged by flames on the turn that he moved into the castle. Yeah, so the next time he moves, then his health will be damaged by one. If he goes clockwise, if he was at three health, he would turn. Now he's at two because of that. And obviously, if there was a tower there, he'd go down by another one because of he, he hits the tower. Right. So obviously, that's something else to take into consideration. But um, in our experience, we haven't gotten uh, climbing trolls crawling over a particular flaming wall that often. Right. So that is that. Let's go ahead and move these out of the way. Last three monsters are in the home stretch. Ready? Okay. <laughs> so these guys, um, they're funny. There's only one copy of each of them in the game. But what's unique about them is they have one really super weak zone and one really invincible zone. <laughs> not, not completely, but mostly. So here we have this Cyclops, and mm -hmm. you can see from the symbols where he is vulnerable and where he's invincible. Let's zoom in a little more. Okay. The symbols are pretty small, so I'm going to try and zoom in some more. That's good. All right. So this Cyclops, what does he do, Michelle? So he isn't injured in the swordsman ring. That's what that means. There's a sword symbol, and there's an X through it. So if he is in the swordsman ring and he is attacked by any hit card, what's a hit card? Not this has... one specifically, but the, has the word hit in its text. Mm -hmm. So any regular knight, excuse me, swordsman or archer, um, if the this monster is in his invulnerable zone where the X is, uh, he cannot be hit by swordsman in this zone, for example, because it says hit in it. So all these basic cards are useless against 
these three monsters in their invulnerable zone. Right. Now, he can still be affected by wizard cards because those are not hit cards. Mm -hmm. But his other uh, symbol right here is... So this shows a skull symbol over an arrow. That means he'll die immediately if he's attacked while in the archer ring. So he's extra vulnerable there, I guess, because they shoot his single eye. I'm not really sure. Yeah. Anyway. So yeah, basically. <laughs> so as you can see here, if the Cyclops is in any archer range and you hurt him in any way, shape, or form, um, yeah, in any way, basically. I uh, don't know why I had to repeat that. Um, <laughs> basically, he will die. But if he is in the swordsman ring, he cannot be affected by swordsman um, or any regular hit card that says hit in it. Right. Uh, he's only vulnerable in his invulnerable range to wizard cards. Right. So that is that. Okay, so then the centaur is similar. He just has different zones that we need to be concerned about. So three hit points. So he can't be hit by archers. In the archer range. Yeah, in the, in the archer range. But he can be killed right away if he's attacked in the night range. He can't stand up to other horses. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> So, yeah, pretty straightforward. It's just like with the Cyclops, but just different zones to be concerned about. And obviously he's vulnerable to wizards, mm -hmm. wizard cards. Mm -hmm. Then in the Golem's case, mm -hmm. you can see the X over the horse symbol. So he can't be hurt by hit cards in the Night Ring. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, he will be killed if he's attacked in the Swordsman Ring. So, and by that, we just want to reiterate that point. If he gets hurt for one damage by anything while in that range he will die right however this does not count if he's set on fire because setting on fire does not mean um it's like it's not a hit it's I not guess. a hit it doesn't cause one damage until you move right right so for example if, since he can die if he's hurt in the swordsman ring this example would apply so if he was already on fire in the night range um, then if he moves forward into the swordsman range after moving forward he would take one hit since he took one hit he was hurt in the swordsman range he is now dead right so that's how fire would hurt him but if he was set on fire in the swordsman range usually setting people on fire does not actually mean causing damage it just puts the token on top of them right and obviously uh, the more flame tokens on this person on this monster the more damage he would take so if he had two, he would take two damage when he moves. Mm -hmm. All right. So those were all the 19 monster tiles and all the 18 imp, uh, not tiles, but tokens Token. uh, in the game. Uh, Castle Panic, the Wizard's Tower expansion. Um, we hope you enjoyed the content of this video. Uh, castle doesn't look very pretty right now, does it? Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, I hope you enjoyed the content of our video. Um, if you enjoyed it, uh, please give us a, a like uh, here on YouTube or on Board Game Geek. Uh, we really appreciate that. If you have any questions, comments, clarifications, or concerns, uh, please give us uh, leave us a message, comment, send us an email, um, and we'll respond to those as soon as we can. Um, and yeah, please subscribe to our channel, The Board Game Tutors, on YouTube um, to get regular updates of whenever we do new videos. And also check us out on BoardGameGeek.com to see all the different content that we produce. Mm -hmm. And our username on BoardGameGeek is the Board Game Tutors, one word. All right. All right. Thanks so much for watching this video. We'll see you in our next video. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.